Welcome back to our second lecture in music and culture. Uh, this time we're going to talk about the idea of culture and the idea of a music culture along with a short and brief introduction to ethnomusicology and, and how it came about and what it means today. First we'll start off with ethnomusicology. It's kind of a long word and oftentimes when you meet people at parties and they say, what are you? I say an ethnomusicologist, and they really have no idea what I'm talking about. But it's a very simple concept. Um, the idea of ethnos is, a, is coming from the Greek of people or communities or folk. And musicology, I'm sure you're all familiar, is the study of music. And so you add those two things together, you get ethnomusicology, the study of people, communities, the study of folk music, the study of pe people's music. And the idea emerged um, in the 1950s, um, out of the idea of this German German comparative musicology that had been around really since before that in the late 1800s. As you can see on the right-hand side of your screen, um, there's a great picture of a, a phonograph and a Native American being recorded. And so really the first thing that happened after the phonograph was invented, the audio recording was invented, the people almost immediately went out and started recording the sounds of the world around them. Before that, no one had any idea what Native Americans or people in the subcontinent of India or anywhere across the world sounded like. And finally, this recording apparatus made it all possible to share that and to study that. Ethnomusicology is a discipline positioned between the fields of anthropology and musicology. So musicology had been, up until the uh, 1950s or a little bit earlier, had been primarily focused on Western European art music. And ethnomusicology was an, an attempt to expand this, to break out of that mold and look and study all of the world's music. And anthropology is the study of, of humans. And so eth ethnomusicology took a lot of the tools from anthropology and added them to our, our toolkit to kind of broaden the scope of, of what musicology had been in the past. So stereotypically, musicology might be studying the works of Bach and Beethoven, etc. Ethnomusicology drew on anthropological social theory and techniques and really went out into the world to kind of broaden the horizons for the study of music and culture. Originally, uh, in the late 1800s to 1950s and 60s, ethnomusicology was the study of, primarily was the study of non-Western music. But nowadays that doesn't really hold true. Many of my friends study music and in the United States, um, in Europe, uh, Canada, etc. So really, nowadays, ethnomusicology and musicology are kind of one discipline, basically studying the world's music and culture. There's some important features that ethnomusicology really pioneered and brought, brought to the forefront. And some of these things are, one of the things is participant observation. And what does this mean? It means instead of just sitting in your armchair, as people may have done in the past, and critiquing records and saying this is good or this is bad according to my own uh, opinion about music, the idea was to go out and observe and participate in the musical events um, that you were studying or attempting to analyze. So in the early days, people would often go to remote kind of uh, Native American tribes or tribes in Africa and uh, be kind of immerse themselves in the, in, the, in the tribe's lives and try to understand music from the inside out. So one of the most important things that ethnomusicology or ethnomusicologists do is field work. I mentioned in the last lecture that I spent a good amount of time in India studying Hindustani music and also studying uh, lullabies in urban areas. And that's one of the key features that differentiates ethnomusicology uh, as compared to kind of more traditional musicology. Although, like I said earlier, both fields are kind of combining and coming together again. So field work is a, a vitally important um, tool or technique that ethnomusicologists use to understand music and culture. They drew this idea of field work from the anthropological field. Um, so it, we're heavily indebted to anthropology as a field. This idea uh, on your screen also of bi-musicality is also important. It was um, pushed by a man named Mantel Hood at UCLA in the 1960s, and he thought that it would be impossible to truly understand um, a culture's music 
without being able to play it yourself. So up until that point, many uh, theorists or ethnomusicologists studied music, but they didn't play it themselves necessarily. And the idea of bimusicality um, really kind of helped immerse the researcher in that in that field and help, help them understand, again, music from the inside out. It's not completely necessary. So I know many ethnomusicologists who don't actually practice the music they're studying, but it's, it's, a, it's a good important feature that um, was pioneered in the 1960s at UCLA. And finally, really ethnomusicology is, is the study of music in its cultural context, or music in culture, music as culture. Um, those ideas are, are central and you can't separate that out from ethnomusicology. So what is culture? In our current usage, you can use culture in several different ways. The first one might be saying, oh, that person is cultured, meaning they have an appreciation of fine art or fine music or, or things like that. But that's not what we're talking about. In ethnomusicology, we're really talking, in anthropology, we're talking about culture that is the entire matrix in, in which we swim. So it's a total way of life of, of a people. It's a way that guides and filters and um, influences the way you think, you, what you feel, how you, what you believe. And it's also a storehouse of pooled learning that is passed on um, through time. And so I learn ways of behaving and ways of being from my parents who learn it from their parents who learn it from their, their family and friends. And so it's just this continual, um, you're passing on information through time and uh, it guides our behavior. So that's, that's kind of a good idea of what, what culture is. The anthropologist Clifford Gertz, I know it's written Geertz, but it's pronounced Gertz, uh, wrote in a, in a kind of a seminal work of his uh, that culture is a system of inherited conceptions expressed in symbolic forms by means of which men communicate and perpetuate and develop their knowledge about and attitudes toward life, uh, men and women. But it's basically a system of symbols that guides and, and that communicates our way of life. It's kind of the entirety of what we swim in in our daily, daily lives. So what is a music culture? As you read in your, in your assigned reading this week, the music culture is the totality of a group's involvement with music. Um, and that includes ideas about music, like what is music supposed to be or what does it do, what function does it serve? And this, the ideas about music can include a music's history, its aesthetics, it's the context for its performance, belief systems that underpin the performance of music. And so sometimes we think of music history as this big, huge, all-encompassing thing. But if you go to different cultures and different localities, they'll have different histories that sometimes contradict each other and, some, and, and are they're kind of concurrent and sometimes contradictory histories. Certainly, as I'm sure you all know, there are di different concepts of aesthetics or what's pleasing and what is appropriate, depending on which culture you're, you're speaking about. Belief systems also underpin ideas about music. So in the center of your, your screen, you're seeing a man calling out the call for prayer in a, in a Muslim city. And really, in tr kind of traditional Islamic thought, the call to prayer is not considered music, even though to most uh, Westerners, at least, the call to prayer can be quite beautiful. It's, it can be very melodic, and so it would be music to, to some people. So uh, belief systems really do influence music. So ideas about music is one aspect of music culture. A music culture also is including things that are like activities and revolving music. So you have concerts, traditional concerts, you have work songs like fishermen songs or songs, uh, you know, Southern uh, spirituals done with to kind of field work music. You have amateur music, you have amateur computer making music, mix mixtapes, you have music that are involved with religious ceremonies, you have music for contemplation or, or meditation. These are all activities involving music or music musical activities that are part that make up one component of a music culture. Music culture also includes a repertoire of music. So 
in the West, in the kind of Western art tradition, we have, you know, repertoires of written by Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, etc. But every culture has their own separate repertoire of music, what constitutes their, their music. And a repertoire of music will include a lot of different components, such as a style of music, say, we have um, like a blues music style, we have a country music style here in America. We have genres of music, you have texts, so written, the words or the, or the, the, um, the text accompanying music. You have compositions, you have transmissions, which is, is how music is, is, how is that repertoire given to the next generation? So sometimes you have a piece of music that you read and you learn it and that's how you, it, it's transmitted if it's written down. In many cultures such as Indian, North Indian classical music, the transmission of music is from person to person. There is no written record. So it's a very different way of learning music. And repertoires of music also include movement. So sometimes music in some cultures is intimately linked to dance and movement and you can't separate them out. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Music culture also includes material culture. So you can see on your screen, printed sheet music, you can see a computer system for mixing and cre or creating sounds. You have a gamelan from Java or Bali, and you have a guitar. It's, and all these things that are, that are instruments, they're tools, they're artifacts, it's all makes up an, one aspect of a music culture. The world also has, each culture in the world has differing concepts of, of what music what music is. So some people might say, like I referenced before, the call to prayer or the Adhan in Islamic countries is not music because it's against their belief system. And some people might say, well, it is, it has melody, it has rhythm, it has text, etc. So in my definition, it is. So every culture has a different way of conceptualizing and actualizing music. And studying that, studying the ways people con uh, conceive of music is a good way of understanding more about that culture, understanding more depth to that culture. So what constitutes music? What constitutes music for you? Is there something you'd hear in your daily lives and say, that's that's not music? I mean, let's think of an old, a stodgy old person who doesn't consider rap music music, says, oh, that's not music. So there are, there are different things that ev every culture and every person has are different ideas about what is music, what makes music. And so in your reading, you had several examples in your reading and your, your weekly listening examples, you had several examples of what is music. And so I want to play a few of them for you. The first here is a, the hermit thrush, which is this very mu melodious bird. And so I'll give you an example of that. So you have repetition, you have melody, you have pitch, you have variation, all in the hermit thrush's song. But is that music? You have to think about that. You have a whale song, which we'll listen to. So again, you have pitch and variation. If we actually had a longer example of it, you'd, you'd have um, repetition and whale songs are we know now are, are communicating very specific things. And so in a, in a sense, they have uh, a kind of oral, it's an oral text, they're communicating ideas. Um, but is that music? Again, that's up for you to decide. And the postal workers uh, example that you have um, down on the page on the, on the Canvas website, when they're canceling, they're hand canceling stamps and that kind of uh, amazing kind of polyrhythm, the kind of syncopated polyrhythm, it's just, it's, they don't, the postal workers themselves said that they don't necessarily think this is music, kind of a great music, but it's just something they do to pass the time to make, make things happen and kind of keep themselves occupied as their job is fairly repetitive. But to our ears, it's pretty awesome uh, sounding. A noted 
musicologist, ethnomusicologist uh, John Blacking wrote in the 1970s, wrote an important work called How Musical is Man, where he actually gave lectures that were later transcribed into a little book. Um, a very short book, but had some great concepts and ideas. And Blacking's idea of what music is, he described it as humanly organized sound, which is fairly broad, but it encompasses, you know, really most of what, uh, what we consider music. It it's, would cut out the idea that the hermit thrush or whale song is, is considered music because Blacking thought it would be organized by humans to be considered music. But it's also a little too broad for some people because humanly organized sound might also include speech, which is organized by humans but isn't generally considered music. So I would ask you, what, how do you define music? Think about it. What, what, what essential features, what makes music to you? Another question that often comes up people ask um, ethnomusicologists is, is music a, a universal language? I mean, that is, since really everyone across the globe, every community has some form of music making, does that cr make it universal? And yes, while, while every human community that we know of uh, has some form of music making, that doesn't mean that music is universally understood. And so ethnomusicologists really try to adopt the position of aesthetic relativism, saying that one culture's music doesn't necessarily, uh, isn't necessarily understood or um, aesthetically pleasing to another culture. So it's not necessarily a universal language, even though music is a universally practiced human phenomenon. So once there's an understanding of another cult culture's language, one, another culture's music, once you spend enough time learning it, then it's, it's, like a, it's like a second language. You can understand it, you can enjoy it, you can use it, and it has meaning for you. Myself, I spent 20 years studying North Indian music, and I find it quite enjoyable. But I know for sometimes for the people who have never heard it before, it can be a little daunting. And so again, music is this, it's not a universal language, but it is something we share as humans. So cultures across the world have different concepts of what, what, what is music, what constitutes music. Some places, uh, some cultures, music is inseparable from dance. Some, uh, some West African and East African cultures, music, you always, music is always accompanied by dance. And so we don't have this abstract concept of music, pure music without movement. Some places, vocal music and instrumental music are differentiated as you heard, or as you read in your, your reading this week, some of us have different, different words for um, instrumental and vocal music and they make that distinction. And there is also different classifications, different genres, just like vocal music and instrumental music. And some cultures don't even have a word for an overall general concept of music. So they classify things differently than we do here in America. So the different, how, how a culture conceptualizes music, how they classify it and how they break it down really has an impact. Um, it helps you understand music from in its cultural context. So I want to review a few key musical concepts that we'll be using in this class to help describe music. So in your in your soundscape paper and in your performance ethnography, you'll be kind of looking to some of these musical concepts to um, help describe what you're experiencing and what you and help write about it. So the the idea of musical structure, um, having everything from rhythm and meter, melody, harmony, form, and performance, these these concepts are absolutely culturally based. And in the following slides, I'll give you some examples and play out how the idea of all these, these concepts can vary between cultures. So the first, let's we'll take rhythm and meter. I think we all get a sense of what, what is rhythm. It's just a pulse. It's a pulse, a strong beat and a weak beat. Um, and a meter is a, a grouping of pulses together. So I'll give you an example of what, what is unmetered music. There are many examples, and I just chose one from the Western uh, kind of um, Renaissance tradition. And I'll give you play this little clip for you.
that was a clip from uh, a Kyrie or a, a, ma a part of a mass from a guy named Palestrina from many hundreds of years ago. And as you can, you can sort of see on your screen, it's a different way of notating music, but there are no bar lines. There's really, it's really hard to group that piece of music and group those strong and weak beats into a meter. So that was an example of unmetered music. Yes, it had a rhythm, but it didn't necessarily have a metric structure of like a four beats or um, repeating four beats or repeating three beats, etc. Here's another example of very, very strongly metered music. And I think you'll enjoy this clip. So what was the meter of that music? How are the pulses, how are the strong and weak, weak pulses organized? If you listen to it, you can hear a very strong four or double pulse, but it's a, it's a four, four meter really. And even though it's got a lot of syncopation in it, it's got a, a definite meter as, as opposed to the previous example where you really couldn't um, group the phrases into regular, in regular um, meters. There's also a thing called polymeter, and we'll encounter that a lot in, in certain cultures, especially in, um, in West African and some East African. A lot of African music has um, a lot of polyrhythms going on. So one example, this would be a fun example you could do on your screen. You see a polyrhythm of 7-5 uh, or 5-7, and you could try it on your body. It's pretty simple to, uh, well, it could be simple to tap out um, three versus two. So one hand tapping three, one, two, three, one, two, three, other hand happened two, so. So tapping three and two, do that on your body, try and get it, get used to it. Then do four and five, five and seven, do different um, polyrhythms and then walk around campus or around town or wherever you are doing this and everyone will look at you strange, but you'll be practicing them something very cool. But polymeter is just the idea that there are two meters going on simultaneously. And there's a thing called free rhythm, right? Where there's not a real regular pulse. There can be no meter and there can be no, there can be a free rhythm with no meter. And here's an example of a, a North Indian uh, musician singing with a very free rhythm without meter it has pulse, but it's not regular, so it's free meter and uh, free rhythm.
So that's a great example of actually it started off with a free rhythm. It's the beginning of a piece in North Indian music called the Alap. And he's free to kind of express and use his voice however you like. And at the end of the clip, really, we heard where the, the, the tabla came in, the drums came in. A, a rhythm and, a, and actually a meter did come in, but it was going so slow it may have been hard for you to kind of pick up on, on the, um, the meter and rhythm. And we'll learn more about that kind of thing later, too. That's all about meter and rhythm. There's a, there's a set of concepts that really accompany melody that also differ from, from culture to culture, pitch, timbre, ornamentation, and scale. And all of these are familiar to you if you're a musician and you're here uh, at the university studying music. But they, like I said, they, they differ depending on which culture you're talking about. So pitch in the, in the West, we have the idea of pitch we have a 12-tone scale. If you play the piano with all the white and black notes, you get about 12 tones between the octave. In other cultures, they have different concepts of what makes up uh, not only uh, an octave, but also what makes up appropriate pitch or what, what is considered in tune. And so as part of melody and pitch, I'm going to give you an example of uh, a um, different ways of tuning. Um, this is a, an Iranian example. And at first, I don't want to, to, to bias to your opinion, but at first it might sound slightly out of tune, but in fact, it's actually perfectly in tune for the Iranian classical music system. So that's a good example of kind of high and low pitch, slightly different tuning system. It's also a great example of another example of, of kind of a free rhythm, that kind of exp um, exponential portion of the Iranian music, classical music. There's the idea of timbre, which is really the tone color of, of an instrument or of or a person's voice. Timbre can be a really pure tone, like if you ring a tuning fork or a, you tap your finger on a nice piece of a nice wine glass it would be a very kind of pure tone or you have this kind of raspy voice of, of certain singers say I think think of Tom Waits or other singers like that who have a very rich kind of raspy voice um, timbre really affects it can be the same pitch you the same you know note but it's a, it sounds different and so um, here's an example of there's a, a an instrument called a picong in the Caribbean um, and this is an example of a person just tuning it. So you'll hear a, a, him striking basically like a little uh, a tuning pitch and then the picon pitch and then the same pitch, but they have very different timbres, so they sound very different. So you heard in there just kind of the, the metallic sound of the tuning and then the tuning up of the pecong and you actually heard a guy say nice. So um, that's an ex example, a really simple example of timbre and we'll, we'll hear a lot more different examples of differing timbres across cultures. There's the idea of ornamentation. So uh, in the West, we have certain concepts of what ornamentation uh, and the appropriate use of ornamentation. So if you're playing Baroque music or classical music, there's 
particular ornaments you use in particular places. Uh, if you're listening to blues music, there's a lot of sliding between pitches that is an ornamentation, really. And this is an example I'll play you of a North Indian sitarist um, taking a melody and just adding all sorts of ornamentation, being bending the notes, sliding between the notes, kind of plucking in different ways and moving his fingers in different ways to add a lot of um, complexity and kind of filigree to the main melody. So he's adding a lot of different types of ornamentation. Uh, as an aside, the kind of the Hindustani system, the North Indian music system has, you know, hundreds of different, very specific ornamentation uh, concepts that uh, are slightly different than what we'd have here in the West, just being trills or slides, etc. But this is a good example of a very famous sitarist giving you one melody, but with a lot of different ornamentation. So you heard some nice bending of pitches, some kind of sliding between notes. Uh, basically, he was repeating the same melody over and over, but he was ornamenting it in different ways and adding different little phrases here and there to make the melody more beautiful. So different concepts of ornamentation, depending on the culture. There's the idea of scale. Like I said earlier, we have a scale in the West, which is basically a 12 tone. You have whole notes and half notes. And in North Indian music, you have essentially the same concept of small differences. Uh, other places in the world have a very different conception of what scale is. An octave would be not 12 notes, but maybe five notes or seven notes. And so here's an example of an Indonesian Javanese um, slendro scale. And the slendro has five pitches. And this is a good example of a five pitch scale um, that also has a different tuning. So again, um, not to bias you, but again, the tuning is going to sound much different than our kind of uh, standard Western tuning. But again, example of a five pitched scale. So what you heard there was a five pitch slendro scale. What you're actually seeing on the right hand side of your screen is a, an instrument that would be actually used for the seven pitched scale. They have the pelog scale. And it was nice that very last um, tone that the instrument instrumentalist played, you could hear that kind of shimmering sound between the, 
that, that what would sound to us as out of tune, that's actually perfectly in tune for the Javanese gamelan type music. So we've got talked about rhythm and meter. We've talked about melody a little bit, some concepts. There's several concepts in the idea of harmony um, that we should talk about. And not every culture has a concept of harmony. Uh, North Indian music is just melody and rhythm. It has no harmony. It doesn't have any um, voices playing together to make harmony. But there's several concepts that you can help um, classify what type, what type of sound you're hearing. Monophonic, heterophonic, homophonic, and polyphonic. And I'll give you some examples of each one of those. So a, a monophonic sound would be something that would be just basically a single voice. So in this next example, you're going to have a single voice with a drone, which sometimes would be considered hetero, heterophonic or m multiple voices. But really, any 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 solo piece is going to be basically monophonic in its in its sound. And I'll give you an example here of this is the epitaph of Cyclos, which is probably the oldest um, notation we have for music. Um, this is from the, between the 200 BC and 100 AD it was written on this pillar as you're seeing it's in uh, a Greek kind of, actually it's a Greek drinking song, but I thought it was pretty, pretty um, beautiful. And it's a good example of the voice at least of monophonic sound. So a nice example of um, monophonic voice with a little bit of um, uh, you know plucking accompaniment underneath it. Hope you could read along in the Greek uh, next to it. If you try hard enough, you can kind of puzzle out the Greek when the when the singer is singing. But a nice a nice example, um, and like I said, the earliest notated music that we know of so far. There's other idea this idea of heterophony, which is multiple uh, voices playing essentially the same rhythm, but having variation uh, between them. And so this is a great example in Irish music where you have the whole band playing a, basically one melody, but each ornamenting it differently. So you get this heterophonic sound. <laughs> So yeah, again, the same same melody, essentially, but ornamented differently. So you get this nice twisting and turning of one melody together. That's heterophony or heterophonic music. There's the idea of homophonic music, which is basically moving in step together. So oftentimes choral music would be considered homophonic music because you have multiple people singing um, basically harmonic music as we would, would listen to it. So this is one uh, example of it. Um, I think you'll know the tune. So the voices in there are um, all moving together. Their rhythm is the same, but they're harmonizing with each other and they're producing a homophonic sound. 
And the last concept in, in harmony that we can talk about is polyphonic music, which is really a lot of music uh, we hear today, but it also was very popular in the Renaissance. And again, I'll use Palestrina to give you an example of polyphonic music, which is multiple voices playing multiple melodies simultaneously to produce kind of the whole of a polyphonic harmony. So a very beautiful example of multiple melody lines singing together, playing, and then creating a, a whole of polyphonic harmony. So we talked about meter and rhythm, we talked about um, melody and harmony, and there's some other examples uh, of the idea of form. And form is both kind of formalized concepts, such as like binary form, which is something like A, A, B, B, like twinkle, twinkle, little star would be an example, or a minuet. Um, strophic form, like most pop examples today would have a verse and a chorus, so it would be strophic in, in a sense. Um, there's a, the idea of a 12-bar blues. It's 12 bars of, of um, one, four, and five chords, or this kind of harmonic progression that stays the same throughout the entire piece, and it's, uh, that progression lasts for 12 metered bars. There's the idea of a theme and variations. Form really is this huge concept that we can talk about um, and it goes and there's lots of sub um, examples of, of form. So there's a sonata form, there's a concerto form, a rondo form, etc. These are all um, I'm glossing over a huge amount of information here. I'm going to give you, give you one example of, of a cyclic form which may be less familiar to you um, as kind of music students in the West. Um, binary form, we know it by heart, like I said, twinkle, twinkle. Strophic form, we know it from all of our pop songs. But cyclic form doesn't necessarily uh, happen as often in the West, but it does in other, in other cultures. And so this example, again, is from, from North Indian music, where the melody is a cyclic melody. It'll, it's one melody repeated over and over, and the instrumentalist or the vocalist will do that melody and then kind of go away from the melody, melody or ornament it differently to add kind of color and variation and, and um, interest. And so I'll give you one example here. Listen for the kind of main melody and then see how the instrumentalist expands on that in, a, in this cyclic form. So hopefully you could hear that there was that one repeating melody and then the instrumentalist would uh, add variation to that. But the repeating melody was in a cyclic pattern of, it was a 16, very fast 16 beat cycle 
um, that we can, we'll, again, we'll hear more about this kind of music later. Uh, this is, again, North Indian music, which is uses a kind of cyclical melody, melodic and cyclical rhythmic forms as a basis for improvisation and composition. So form is uh, another very important aspect. We have rhythm. Uh, we also have performance. Performance is, is important to understand. It's not necessarily a musical concept like form and harmony, but it's important to understand how musicians are supported. So in the, in the West, it's a very much a kind of a capitalist society. You, you go and you get hired by the, the club owner to play your music. But in other, other parts of the world, other, other countries, other cultures, musicians are supported in very different ways. And this changes how they perform and what they perform. In West Africa, the kind of griots of West Africa are hereditary musicians who perform for their patrons, who perform for kind of wealthy families to kind of recount their lifestyle or their family's history. Um, that, so it changes the type of music they play, it changes how they perform. So performance is, is very culturally, um, culturally uh, has a lot of cultural context you need to understand. Um, the lifestyles of musicians is, uh, again, really important to understand. Uh, from kind of a, to understand music and culture, you have to understand how musicians live their lives. So, um, for example, um, the kind of austere, sometimes austere lives of of North Indian musicians, especially back a few, a few years ago, um, where they would kind of practice all day long and then be employed by the court and perform infrequently. Uh, contrast that to like uh, you know Aerosmith or ACDC, their lives are touring around and you know, being doing crazy things. The lives of musicians, the lifestyles of musicians are dramatically different depending on the cultural context. And you also have to understand the idea of um, performance context and the institutions that support music. So in some places, uh, governments, uh, some cultures in the world, governments are, are very involved in supporting music and, and performance. Others are not. Um, our government in the United States has had a, a record of supporting some arts, and they've been steadily cutting that uh, support over the years. But other private organizations and philanthropic institutions have also helped support um, support music. Um, in especially here in America, we have oftentimes have school music programs, and so I started learning the viola uh, when I was in uh, was it fourth grade. In other cultures, that doesn't happen. Really, music in the schools is not a not a thing, and so that kind of shapes the way music is performed and received. So music can be understood as humanly organized, humanly organized sound, as we talked about before, the kind of the, the purposeful organization of sound. Music is really a form of communication. It conveys emotions, it conveys history, it conveys, um, conveys other uh, abstract ideas. It has a lot in common with language, like um, it actually is intimately tied. If you think of popular song, think of opera, other things, language is absolutely part of it. Um, and music has really been performed throughout history, through all of human culture. Uh, since prehistoric times, we have uh, examples of bird bone flutes that are, that are many tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years old. Music is also very difficult to describe in, in non-musical means. And that's what I'm gonna ask you to do in this class is to write about music for several of your assignments. And that's not easy, and I understand that. But I think having to, pushing yourself to describe music and performance and context and culture, pushing yourself to write about it, uh, gets, it gets you to think about it in a different way. So last, I think the idea of performance, um, some peoples and some cultures concept of music don't always match the way um, music is performed and experienced. So some people, some cultures claim that music is highly valued, um, but then, then they don't necessarily compensate their musicians for that. So um, the US might be a great example. Uh, you look at orchestra performers and things like that. Those are often held up as kind of pinnacles of our, of our good culture, but if you look at the kind of economics of, of orchestras and, and music teaching in the United States, they're really not supported very well. So um, that's difficult. Or, or example, for example, uh, rock music is, or rap music or whatever kind of uh, edgy popular music you want to talk about, oftentimes that's kind of denigrated by the people in, and people in power saying it's a danger to the, the youth, the morals, even though it's um, highly lucrative, right? And so, 
asking the questions about how how music supported at studying the lifestyles of musicians, studying the performance context and what institutions, and asking about the social activities and the activities about the status of musicians is really important to understanding how music is fully um, enmeshed in culture, how the culture treats music and, and musicians and, and, and what it produces. So as a little recap, um, there are the four components of music culture. There's ideas about music, and that involves history, aesthetics, etc. There's activities involving music. Is it a work song? Is it just a um, popular music song for entertainment? Is it a religious song? Um, is it a lullaby for kids? There are repertoires of music that vary between culture. So that I, in, in the um, again, like in the West, we have this kind of large corpus of of written music. In other places, it's transmitted orally, and so it's definitely a person-to-person -person transmission. And there's also the material culture of music. So the violin is very different than uh, the sitar, and the African drums are very different than you know the the piano. So the material culture of music matters in a huge way, and is always is very much determined by what culture the music comes out of. There are the key musical concepts we discussed: rhythm and meter, melody, harmony, form, and performance. You can go back through the video and make sure you understand. Um, some of the, some of the key concepts um, that will kind of help you understand and analyze music and performance as we go forward. So to wrap up, thanks for sticking with me through another lecture. Um, I just want to remind everyone to make sure to review the listening examples on your own. There are a couple assigned this week that I didn't really discuss in the lecture proper. Uh, the, the one from Eastern European, Europe, um, Sister Hold Your Chastity, which I think is a really interesting way um, of uh, singers working together and singing together that is different than what we've experienced before. And the Gagaku Japanese example, the court music of Japan, is um, incredibly interesting and precise. And uh, each example shows um, very much how the culture that produced that music um, it, each example shines light on the culture that produced that music, I should say. But I won't necessarily review all the listening examples in the lectures, so make sure you check out check them out on your own. And um, just as a uh, just a reminder, friendly reminder, try to complete the readings um, that are due during the week that they're due. If you fall behind, like I said in the first lecture, if you fall behind in the readings or the listening examples, it's very hard to make up. So I look forward to. Um, uh, hopefully you'll look forward to next week where we talk about music, soundscapes, and place, and have a great weekend.